I'm going to be talking about Rapture, which is a, a collection of libraries for doing kind of everyday tasks, including I.O., uh, JSON processing, cryptography, a few other things that I won't talk about, but, but the, the, the focus of the talk today will be those things. I've, I've been, uh, I've been travelling around Europe the last couple of months, giving this talk to, uh, to various people in, in various user, Scala user groups in different cities in Poland and, and Germany and, and, and so on. And um, I had quite a hectic schedule, and uh, they, they, all kind of, they all kind of ran into, ran into each other and uh, uh, ended up being, being quite tired. But it, it's, it's really good to be here in, um, in uh, Portland. <laughs> and uh, uh, good to see so many of you here. Uh, this is actually going to be the, um, probably the final outing for this talk. That's, no, no, down. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's fine, yeah. And then we leave them, OK? This, this will probably be the final outing. Um, so hopefully this, this means that the talk will be well-practiced, quite slick, and uh, no, probably not. Anyway, um, people who don't know me, I, um, I, it, it's, been, it's been complained, people have made the complaint before that I, haven't, I don't explain who I am at the beginning of my talks, and... Uh, I just dive straight into them. So I, I'm, I, I, I don't really like giving a, a sort of long history of what I've, what I've done and so on. So I'll, I'll hand over to Paul Phillips, who, who keynoted here last year, who, uh, who very kindly, uh, I, I think I must have said something to offend him, but he, he put this up as, his, as his, one of his slides in, uh, in a talk he gave in Boulder. Um, so... Yeah, it, it's, taken me, it's taken me 10 years to gain 10 years' worth of programming experience. I think it took Paul one year to gain that much. Um, and then he goes off and goes and uh, uh, slags off Western Europe. Um, yeah, I think back, back then I was... I think the thing that annoys me most about this is how blurry this photo is. He could have... There's been loads of very sharp photos of me on the internet. This is not one of them. Uh, so I think that's what annoys me most. Anyway... I quite like this John pretty slow. I, I, was, uh, I, was, I was very pleased with that. So, I, uh, so for Scala Days in, in Berlin this year, I had that put onto a, onto a T-shirt. So I, I, I am John pretty slow and, and quite proud of it. Um, more recently, I've been, I've been working on, uh, on, on Rapture. I, I'm now kind of full-time on Rapture. I, uh, I, I quit my job in, in August. Uh, and, and moved out of my flat as well, so I could go travelling and, and telling people about, uh, about Rapture, as I am today. So effectively, I am, I am unemployed and homeless. So um, thank you, everyone, who's been very welcoming to me here and uh, very charitable. Uh, the format of the talk today will be a series of one-liners. So I've called it the art of the one-liner. What I will do is I'll show you a line of code, it's the kind of thing you can type into the REPL, and then the response you get from the REPL. So to get started, oh, by the way, if anyone has any questions at all as I'm, as I'm speaking, just shout out, or um, if, if you're reluctant to do that, put your hand up and I might notice you, but I prefer just shouting out. Um, I, 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 like, I like the feedback. It's, uh, uh, I think an interactive talk is a, is a better one. So this is, this is a line of code from, uh, from Rapture. This is how you define an HTTP resource. So nothing particularly exciting. We, we have a URL, which is http slash slash raptor.io slash sample.json. It's a mini DSL. Nothing particularly exciting. And I'm going to call that a resource. I'll explain what that is in a second. Here's another one. This is a file URL. Looks very similar. So this represents a file on, on disk in the same way that the previous one represented a, uh, an HTTP resource. That was actually the, uh, the old way of writing them. So that, that, that was in Rapture up until the, uh, the most recent release. We can, we can describe an HTTP URL like this now. This is, this is a string context. So you've probably seen a similar... Actually, who, who, who thinks this looks a little bit weird? So if you... If you Eric, surely not. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, uh, I'll have to ask a different question. Who thinks this looks completely normal? Really? OK, so you've, you've probably seen uh, similar things with an S, lowercase s there, which is a, an interpolated string. 
And what that means is that the content you put in here is, is interpreted in some special way. It's not a string. It, it's, it, it, it actually invokes a, a method on, the, on what's called the string context and interprets it in some interesting way, which means, as a result, we get an HTTP URL. So that's all cool. We, we get to use the, the pretty standard syntax without having to convert to those slashes and, 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 and strings as I showed you before. So this is, this is better. This is easier. Now, notice that we get an HTTP URL as a return type here. If we have a file here, notice that this is exactly the same, pretty much, apart from the content here, but the type is different. So at, at compile time, Raptor knows, by virtue of some magic, by which I mean a macro, it, it works out that this is representing a file URL, and therefore it's able to give us a typed result from this. And we can put any, any kind of scheme in there that Rapture knows about. It knows about things like class paths and FTP as well. So that's all fine. Now, these are all, these are all resources. And I, I, I'm using this, this resource phrase very, in a very, very vague sense. There's no, there's no trait or interface that, that, that represents a resource. A resource is a resource by virtue of having capabilities. And a capability is something like being able to read from that thing, or being able to write to it, or being able to check the size of it, or delete it, or rename it. All, all kind of standard, standard I.O. tasks that you're probably very familiar with um, from, from other libraries. So a resource is a resource not because it inherits from a certain interface or trait. It's a resource because there are capabilities available for it or defined on it. The way they're defined is using the what, what's, what used to be called the pimp my library pattern, but that name has been deprecated in favor of Rob Norris's name, which is bedazzle my library. <laughs> so over the course of the talk today, I will be bedazzling these resources with various capabilities. And um, it's a much better name, isn't it? Yeah. I think everyone should go out and, and, and start using bedazzle my library instead of pimp my library. So there we are. Um, this, this is fine in the case where um, we know at compile time what kind of resource it is. So we, we know this is the file. It's there literally in the code, so we can work out this is the file URL. If, for example, it's, it comes from user input, there's no way at compile time we can, we can get the type from that. It's just not known. So we have to specify. We have to say HTTP.parse, and this is, a, this is an ordinary string here. Uh, and then we'll get an HTTP URL. There's also a corresponding file.parse and, 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 and the same for all the other, the other resource types. So our first, our first capability that we'll see is slurping. So slurping is to pull all the data from that resource into memory. It takes a type parameter, which is byte. And as a consequence of that, we get this thing back, which is a bytes type. Bytes is part of, part of Rapture. It's a very, very simple wrapper around an array of bytes. Why have I done that? Well, I don't like working with array of bytes, because it's mutable. And we, we generally, as functional programmers, we prefer uh, immutable data types. So although this is just backed by an array of bytes, it's a simple wrapper around it. And also, we get this nice two-string method. So you can see exactly what the content is, uh, assuming you can read hex. You all can, right? Uh, it's slightly more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. So the, the, the question was, do I have a type class for each possible parameter that goes here? Uh, the answer is effectively yes. And it's actually each combination of uh, parameter, uh, parameter here and resource type. So if you introduce your own resource type, which you, you're perfectly capable of doing, or you're able to redefine an existing or create an existing thing as a resource, you specify a type a type class that, that tells Rapture how to read it, how to write it, how to check the size of it, and so on. Um, and in, case, in the case of slurping, it needs to read it. And we, we, we provide two, one for, one for bytes and one for characters. But you could provide others as well. So this is, this is bytes. Bytes aren't that useful in, in many situations. We'd, we'd much rather work with uh, strings, because we can actually read them then. So what we can do is we can say slurp characters. Now, you've probably noticed this big red error message here. I'll, I'll read that to you. It says, error, cannot find implicit reader for file URL resources. File URL resources can only be read if a reader implicit exists within scope. Now, that's, 
not particularly meaningful, except in the context of the question that, that was just asked over there. The reader is the, is the type class. But it goes on to say, note that if you're working with character data, you will require an implicit character encoding. For example, import encodings.system or import encodings.utf8. Well, this is actually telling us exactly what we need to do to fix this error. Now, why have I done this? Well, I, I'm, I'm trying to redress the, the, fi fix the problem that, um, that Java introduced, uh, which is to make the really, really, really stupid assumption that if you don't specify the encoding, that you must be using the system encoding. Now, what that means is, what, what, so what, why, is why do I think that's such a stupid decision? Well, it means that the code you write, if, if you don't specify which character encoding you're using, you write some code, it'll work fine on your machine. It'll probably work fine on a friend's machine or a colleague's machine. It might work on all the, all the development machines in your, in your organization, because maybe you're all using uh, OS X. And then you go and deploy it onto a, onto a server, which has a, a, a different system encoding, and suddenly it stops working. Just because it's assuming the system encoding, some environmental information, rather than having it specified in the code, it starts failing in, in, in probably quite subtle ways. You probably start seeing uh, unusual characters or question marks in the, in the strings in the system. It probably, probably runs fine without exceptions, but, but you start seeing subtle degradation in, in, the, in, the, in the software. So this, this, actually, this completely undermines Java's portability. So I've done away with that. If you want to do anything in Rapture with characters, with strings, uh, or converting between strings and bytes, you have to specify an implicit encoding. And we do that like this. Import encodings dot, in our case, we're going to use UTF-8. You can, you can specify anything here. Uh, note that I've got the backticks there, which um, allow us to, to write this in the, in the canonical form with, with the, the dash there. And then we try exactly the same thing. This is the same line we had before. And we get this string result here. So the return type, because we're slurping characters, it's not bytes. It is now a string. So is that all OK? I've, had, I've only had one question so far, I think. Does that all make sense? Cool. Um, right, what's next? Ah, so we're going to move on to some JSON processing now. So, so rather conveniently, this, uh, uh, this string looks a lot like it's probably some JSON. So given some JSON in a string, what we, what we probably want to do is parse it. So I can call json.parse. This is, this is in the Rapture JSON library now. And what we get is, well, this looks like it's exactly the same thing, except the type is now this JSON type, uh, which means that it's successfully parsed and the, uh, it, it, is, it is in some internal representation of that uh, structured JSON type. OK. Now, that, that was actually a two-step process, because first we had to slurp it, and then we had to parse it. When I get round to the 1.0 release of Rapture.io, you will be able to do this. You'll be able to specify simply any resource. Sorry, this, this, this one liner splits onto multiple lines. Um, this, this may be a theme as we, uh, as we approach the end. <laughs> uh, we, we may get up to three lines at some point. Anyway. We, we, can, we can specify this as one, as one line of code, even if, not, if it's not one, one uh, projector slide. We can specify, we can specify any, any readable resource here, and it will be happy to parse that. It'll, it'll read it into memory, and, and uh, that, that will just work. Uh, so this, is, this has exactly the same result as the previous one. Yeah? OK, so it depends on some stuff I haven't told you yet. But in this particular case, it will, it will load it all into, all into memory. Now, if you, if you had a JSON parser capable of doing the streaming, there are, there are ways um, that, 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 could be, that could be made to work in a, in a more efficient way without, without loading everything into memory. Um, I'll, I'll um, tell you a bit more about that later. Okay. Uh, Ask me about that in about 10 slides' time. That, that, is, that is comprehensively covered, yeah. But at the moment, if this, so for now, if this fails, it will throw an exception. And if that makes you feel uncomfortable, that's good, because I'm going to fix it later. OK? Yeah? Did you implement the JSON parser from scratch, or you wrapped it in JSON? 
I'll answer that in probably 15 slides' time, I think. <laughs> any, any other preemptive questions? <laughs> I, I, I do love this. This, this. It happens every time I give the presentation. People anticipate the slides I'm about to show. Um, I, I sometimes wonder whether I just shouldn't have them, and I, I should have a completely random set to see if people anticipate, anticipate them as well. Anyway, we've, we've got this JSON type, and um, I'm calling dot candidates on it. Now, does my JSON type have a candidates method? Well, it looks like it does, because I'm calling dot candidates. And this, I, I promise this compiles. And it gives a result, uh, type JSON. But did I, did I anticipate that candidates, which is from this, uh, this, this key in the JSON map here? Uh, no, no, this, 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 is, this is Scala code. Yeah, I mean, it looks like JavaScript. Um, it, it's, it's been completely happy to compile this. What's actually happening is this is using Scala's dynamic trait. Uh, who's familiar with dynamic? So um, who's not familiar? And who didn't put their hand up? <laughs> <laughs> who still didn't put? Yeah, OK. Uh, so probably about, probably about half and half, I think. Um, so the dynamic trait allows you to tell Scala how to interpret a method call to a method that doesn't exist. So what Scala does is it converts this call here into an application to the select dynamic method, passing candidates as a string. So all this is is it's syntactic sugar in, in, in the purest sense. So this is, this is, you can think of this as a uh, dynamic access. So we are very much in the dynamic world of JSON here. We can call dot anything here, if you like. This, I mean, this, this happens to, to be something that exists, and it works fine. We can also index into that array. So this, you'll see, returned an array. We've got the square bracket there. If we access the, the first element, that will, that will give us this, uh, this result here. Note that every time I do this, it returns something of type JSON. So JSON is like the, the, the dynamic type. Everything you do, if you call dot name on that, we've still got type JSON here. Even though this is clearly a string, the compiler doesn't know that. It only happens to be known at runtime that this is a string. So how do we get from this dynamic world of JSON? Because we can't call dot substring or dot index of on this, because that will be treated as, as if it's an index into a, into a JSON object. We want, we want a real string to come out of this so that we can actually do statically typed code. What we do is we call dot .as. We call dot .as string in this case, and it's perfectly happy to interpret that as a string. Note that the, the quotes have gone missing because it's no longer a JSON string. It is just a plain string, and that's how the REPL will, will display that. So we're back in the static world, and we can do all the normal static things that we, 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 we love about Scala, and we can leave behind that nasty dynamic mess. Sorry, say that again. Uh, so it, it does throw an exception, uh, and the <laughs> exception will be a type mismatch exception. But um, if everybody's getting really uncomfortable with exceptions, I'm, I still think that's a good thing because I will still fix that. Um, it, it will either it will throw one of two things generally. It will either throw uh, a type mismatch exception or a missing value exception. Those those are the two possibilities. We can get an int as well. So there we are, there's the, there's the value. Uh, now this, this is actually something, someone tweeted me last night and, and, and said, well, I've got, I've, got some, I've got some JSON code where my values are, are always integers, but they might be in quotes or not in quotes. So they might be represented as JSON strings or they might be as represented as, as ints. How do, I, how do I do that? Well, what you can do is you, you, can, you can rewrite your, the extractor. This is the type class which tells Raptor JSON how to extract integers. And we can compose existing extractors. This is the, this is, this is the new slide today because someone tweeted me last night with this question, and the, the, uh, the, the solution is quite simple. So we can, uh, we, we, can, we can access the extractor, the extractor type class which tells Raptor JSON how to do the extraction like that. And then we can combine it with another one using or else. So what it's saying is try this one first. Try and extract an int using the standard canonical int extract. And if that fails, try and extract the string and then map the result to an integer. So the return type of this is an extractor, as we see here, extractor of an int 
uh, for JSON, as it turns out. And then it will just work if you try and extract something uh, that, that might be an int in JSON, might be a JSON string. It will always return an int using this. If it's a Boolean, then you still possibly get a type mismatch exception. OK. So it's all very well being able to access single primitive values, like integer strings, Booleans, and so on. But we probably want to work with more structured data as well. So a case class. Let's say we wanted to extract a candidate. Now, you've, you've probably noticed that the, um, the, the JSON I was using was, was some sample stuff uh, representing the, uh, the last presidential election. <laughs> so there are, there are two candidates in that JSON. One of, them, um, one of them is Barack Obama, and he has a name and an age, which we extracted last time. We can define this case class candidate with the parameters name and age here, and we can, we can actually just extract straight into that case class with no other specification required. And we get this, this instantiated case class here. So in, in, in one line, well, two lines, we've got, we've got the, the definition and then we've got the extraction here. We're, we're pulling out structured, statically typed uh, results from our JSON. So, so what, it, what it does is it, it looks at every parameter in the, in the case class, and if it's able to extract that parameter, it's able to extract the entire case class. Um, so basically, they compose by parameters based on the, the name of those parameters. So it assumes that the, uh, the, 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 the key inside the JSON map corresponds to the name of the parameter in the case class. Is that OK? Uh, it doesn't, uh, by default, it doesn't care about any additional ones that it's not looking at. Uh, so, it, so um, I think, I think it's, it's not possible at the moment to, um, to tell it to fail on, on extraction if there are uh, extraneous keys there. But it's something I would like to provide, and it's something I provide in a, in a similar way later on, which I'll, I'll show you. But... Uh, it, it, is, it is configurable using implicit to, uh, or will be configurable using implicit to, uh, to specify how that should behave. Uh, yeah, you're, you're five slides ahead of me again. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, you can do that. Uh, right, so I promised an explanation of how I handle errors. So uh, how am I doing for time? Uh, I've got 20 minutes left. Okay. This might get faster, and I might, I might skip bits. So we want to have uh, some, some people want very quick results. They want to get a JSON value back that, uh, that, that will, will give you a value, for example, in the REPL, that you can access straight away, or have an exception thrown if it fails. Because in the REPL, that's a very convenient way of doing things. So everything I've shown you so far works like that. Now, I invented this idea called modes to provide alternative ways of getting the results from methods which might fail, which might throw an exception. So parsing is, is a fallible method. It, it could fail. Extracting a particular value type might fail. I've already said it. It might return a type mismatch, or it might turn, return a missing value exception. But by default, they will be thrown rather than handled in any nice way. If you import this, if you import modes.returnTry, then exactly the same thing we, we did before, the return type will change. This probably seems very, very magic. And, and it, is, it is a bit magic, but it's not macros this time. What this does is uh, it uses a, a, a mode type class, which allows it to wrap the, re, the, the result in a, in, a, in, a, in a nicer way of handling it. So in this case, we've, uh, we've returned a try of the candidate. And when we call as, that is, that is the point at which this will, this will fail, potentially. And, and therefore, that is the point at which we are returning a try. Alternatively, this was kind of a discovery rather than, uh, rather than by design. You can have a mode that will return a future. So every, every operation you, you call, for example, this slurp method here, will get dispatched to a, to a thread pool, an execution context, based on whatever your implicit execution context is. And this will be, this will be handled on a different thread, and we'll get a future back instead. And there are, there are other modes as well. So uh, in 25 minutes or so, Brendan will be talking about uh, Scala-Z. And 
he will talk about validations and uh, and, and other um, other other special return types for handling errors in, in Scala Z you can use. They're all completely pluggable into into Rapture's modes, and modes are used extensively in all the in all the all the methods. Um, anything that might fail will uh, will be affected by the, the implicit mode that is in scope at any one time. So. I haven't given you a lot of detail on how they work. It is, it is quite complicated, um, but not macros. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of showing you rather than explaining it. So you'll, you'll have to kind of imagine how I made this work. But it, uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty useful if you, if you have different, different contexts where you want to use the same API. From my point of view, I didn't have to implement this API for a dozen different possible return, return types. Ah, right, so you could compose modes, yeah. So you can, the, the, the mode is an implicit value. What you can do is say Im, implicit my mode, implicit val my mode equals um, modes dot return either, compose modes dot uh, return future. Yeah, and, and that, will, that will put one within the other. I can't remember which way around they are. You, you can uh, try it, see what you get. Uh, right, so um, we actually had several, back, back, back to our Jason, we had several <coughs> candidates. In, in, our, in our JSON here. So what we can do is we can try and extract them as a list. Now, we can extract a list of candidates if we can extract a candidate. And I've demonstrated we can extract a candidate. Therefore, this will return a list uh, of candidates here. Uh, as was, was, um, was Paul Phillips' talk here last year the one where he completely slated the collections library, or was it the other one? It was the collections <laughs> library. Yeah? Okay, well... This, this interacts really nicely with the Scala Collections Library because you can extract any kind of, uh, any, any type you like. So stack is uh, one of the more obscure types in the, in the collection library, but you, you, can, you can completely extract this. That's fine. You get a stack. Or even something mutable like a hash set. That all, that all just works fine. And we could even define another case class. So this is, this is the, uh, the question about composition of case classes. Provided candidates is extractable. Well, it's an index sequence of candidates. Uh, and a year, well, that's trivially extractable. We can therefore extract an election. So given this, this one line here, plus the definition of an election and the definition of a candidate, we can actually extract this entire statically typed result from our dynamic JSON. So it, there, there is a single point of failure, which is where we extract this. And um, we, 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 are, we are extracting this in, in, in one go, transforming the entirety of our dynamically typed JSON into statically typed Scala objects. Uh, and obviously, depending on, on whether you had a, a mode like return try present, this would be wrapped in, in, a, in a try, so it might be a success or a failure, and then you could handle the, the failure types appropriately. So I think this is pretty neat that we, we have such a concise way of extracting, extracting data from JSON. Uh, yeah, questions front. Uh, no, no, so the, the, um, the extractors for case classes are generated automatically. Is that what you meant? Oh, uh, there, there, is, there is a macro that will, will examine the case class definitions and check that it's possible to extract all of the parameters. And if it is, then it will, it will construct at the point of the macro inv invocation a new, uh, a new extractor type class instance that will allow, it to allow this to work. And that, that, that happens recursively, so you can have nested, nested structure there. Uh, yeah, Eric. So if I have like a giant hierarchy, and I call as like 20 times in a row, like add, you know, I want to get the universe, and then get another universe, and another universe, is that going to build me 20 different type class instances that are all the same, or will it somehow reuse the same? They're all the same type, but it's being asked, it's being asked for implicitly 20 different times. How, how so it, it will... Um, uh, it, I think it will. It'll, it'll, it won't cache them. It probably ought to. It'd be nice if it did. Let's talk about that later. Right. It, 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 it sounds like a problem you've already solved for something else. Possibly. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can also create JSON if we want to. So this is this is another string context. We we put our JSON straight into a string there, and 
this is the result we get. That's pretty simple. Um, we can also substitute values in. So this, this will convert this into the appropriate JSON type, which gets substituted in, that, in, in place. We can add single values to a map. We just use this, this syntax here, which probably looks a little bit weird. Um, this, is, this is kind of a bit like a lens into the, in, into the, the vote. So we're, we're specifying the, the path into the, into the JSON type. This is meant to be equivalent to how you'd add a value to a map. So with a map, you would maybe have a, a string key here, and then you'd have the value there. With JSON, you don't have a simple key. It's actually a, a, a path into the, into the structure. So this is specifying the, the year value there that we're, we're adding to the original. Now, this is, this is maybe weird. This is pattern matching on, on JSON. Who thinks this looks weird? <laughs> yeah. I, it, it should look weird. I, I, don't, I don't know anyone else who's using this particular feature of Scala, oh, apart, apart from quasi, quasi quotes. But you can, you can pattern match on some JSON. So what this is saying is our, our vote, this is, this is JSON typed. We're going to try and match that against some structure. So we're saying, first of all, is it an object? Is it an object that has, the, uh, has a vote key? Does that vote key represent another object, which itself has a name? And if all those things are true, then we will extract the value at that vote.name uh, value, key, uh, in, into the identifier C, which will come out as something typed as JSON. So C is JSON. Therefore, we can call as string in the same way as we did before to, to move again from the dynamic world of JSON to the static world of Scala. We have to do this, and we get a string out. And we can have multiple things matched at the same time. We only have to specify here the, uh, the, 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 the structure that we're matching on. Any, any extra keys by default won't be, won't be matched. Uh, yeah? Is there any syntax check on whether you're Yeah, at compile time, it will, it will check that this is, this is valid, uh, JSON. So if you, if you missed off a, a, quote, that, a quote or a, a brace somewhere, it will, it will tell you at compile time. Yeah? Uh, not really. Um, I've, I've thought about ways of doing this. So, um, I think Scala would need to change a little bit first. I mean, you, you, could, you could have an additional extractor in there. Uh, like, you, you could define a nested extractor that, that translates JSON into some specific uh, type. But you'd, you'd need an instance of every single possible JSON. You'd need an instance of an extractor for every single possible JSON type in order to write it there. You can't, you can't specify the type in, uh, in square brackets as I think you would like to do, uh, in line in, in, in the code there, unfortunately. You could, uh, so you could, you could put an if there that, that, that checks whether it works, yeah. OK, so someone asked me about, uh, have, I, have I re implemented my own JSON parser? Now, I, I, I thought that probably Scala has enough JSON parsers already. <laughs> Does anyone disagree? And, and also, I'm probably not the best person to be implementing a, a parser. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really a performance guy. So I, uh, as, as Eric uh, identified. Uh, so what I do is I wrap other people's parsers. So one possible parser you can use is the standard library, Scala JSON parser. Is this anyone's favorite Scala, uh, uh, sorry, JSON parser? Good. That's the right answer. Um, it is, it is deprecated in, in Scala 2.10, or not deprecated in 2.11, and uh, I think has maybe removed in 2.11 and deprecated in 2.10. It, it is horrendously slow, and you don't want to use it. The only reason you might want to do this is to avoid any third-party dependencies. But by, by importing this, it's like a configuration parameter. You can, you can choose how your AST will be represented and how your parser will work. That's one possibility. Um, you can use Jackson. Who uses Jackson? Can we, can we, can we have a little cheer if I, if I mention your favorite JSON parser? So, so Jackson? OK. Uh, how about Jason for S? Oh, that's possibly a bit more. Uh, Spray? OK. We've got, we've got a diverse crowd here. Uh, Lyft? Well, well done. Well done for persevering. Um, all, all of these are supported by... Uh, uh, by Raptor Jason. Argonaut. Yeah. Oh, a clap. 
And I, I, I never get any cheers for this one. Yes. <laughs> so, is there anyone other than Eric using John? You should. John is, John is uh, am I right in saying it's, it's sometimes faster than Jackson? Yeah. So, so I've, I've, I've been telling everybody, like, I've done 20, <coughs> I've done this presentation 20 times in Europe. Every time I say, uh, John is faster than Jackson. But that, that, is, that is true. I, ha I haven't been lying. Well, uh, yeah. Actually, Eric, could you come up to the front a second? So, <laughs> <laughs> so John, John is, um, I suppose you'd say, quite fast. Would, uh, would, you, would you like to wear that? Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so this, 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 um, this comes about because the, the way Eric says John is, I think, exactly the same way as you say my name, isn't it? Yeah, John. Which, which is obviously the, the, the most obvious reason to use John rather than anything else. <laughs> So John, John is a, uh, a, a fast uh, Jason passer. Use, use John rather than anything else. Um, if, for example, you had to use two, you had like some library code that was, that was using um, Argonaut and some other code that was using John, say this, this vote had been created in, in the Argonaut code, and we, we were now in a, in a context where, where we had uh, John. What we can do is we can, we can kind of extract, and it's not really extracting, it's more conversion, but we can convert that vote from one type of JSON to another just by calling dot as JSON. So that's, that's, a, that's a really neat way of moving between two different, two different kinds of JSON. If you happen to be in the awkward situation where you are, you, you have may, maybe, maybe two different libraries, both of which depend on different JSON libraries, and you want them to somehow work together. This, this seems to be something that if you, if you encounter the problem it's incredibly frustrating because what people normally do is they serialize to a string and they reparse it in the other parser, which is just a horrible solution. This will actually uh, walk, the, walk the tree and translate as it goes. We can also do mutable JSON, uh, at least if we have time. Yeah, I've got 10 minutes. So we can, we can do mutable JSON. Um, if you, who, who likes mutability? Yay. So it, it's, available, it's available if you want to use it. Um, in, in the same way that there's a list buffer that's like a mutable list, we have a JSON buffer that's uh, a mutable JSON. So we can create an empty one of those. There it is, <coughs> just some empty parentheses. And we can specify that the life, life value of, of that is going to be equal to 42. So there it is. That, that, that has mutated. It's, it, it's a reference to the same object, but it now has this life thing in here. We can even like, go, go deep within, uh, deep, deep within a, a nested structure. By the way, I'm... I'm I, I do keep meaning to change my sample JSON to something less politically... Or pe people accuse me of being politically biased. It's not, it's not deliberate at all. I'm not trying to... So certainly, certainly not coming from Europe. And I'm, I'm representing... Uh, uh, where's my... I had a, I had a tag. My, my tag says I'm representing Europe <laughs> t t uh, today. So, my, my, I, so for me to come over from Europe and start suggesting uh, uh, Republican or Democratic uh, candidates in my sample JSON is not in... It's not trying to sway anyone's politics at all. I, I'm, I'm in no position to do that. And you're quite capable of doing it yourselves. So, nevertheless, Hillary Clinton is my example of another candidate for another election. Um, and we can, we can add that, that uh, case class value there. And it will serialize the case class to JSON. So that, that, that is an object in itself. Any type on the right-hand side will, will be fine as long as it is itself serializable. When I say serializable, it's, it's sort of the, the inverse of extractable. And, and generally speaking, anything that's extractable can be serialized back again. Uh, oh, uh, one thing I'll say about this is that it's, uh, although, although it's, uh, we, we probably don't want to use mutability, it's actually quite a convenient way of having uh, an inefficient but, but really lightweight object database that will store case classes, that will store primitives that will store collections. You, you, you basically specify the value that you want to change, what, what you want it to be, and it will, it will mutate it in place, in memory. When we've done that, our, our JB value, we can, we can write that to a, uh, a file. Now, this is, this is back in the Raptor I.O. world again. JB is a resource 
It's a JSON buffer. How is it a resource? It's a resource by virtue of being readable. So a JSON buffer can be read. A file can be written to. So if you've got something that's readable and something that's writable, we can write from one to the other. That's all we do. So we've then, we've then committed that, that JSON buffer to disk in a single line. And we get a summary here, which tells us how many bytes were, were written. Uh, because we, I could return unit, but that's not very meaningful. So we get, a, we get a write summary back so that we can at least get some understanding of what happened when we did the write. Uh, we can also do a copy to. Copy to is subtly different. Uh, in the case of two files, there's a, there's a faster way of doing that than streaming all the data into memory and streaming it out again. We can use the, uh, we can use the fact that file systems have a, have a pretty efficient copy method that we, can, that we can use if we know the source file name and the, the destination file name. This will send a message to the file name. It's effectively the, the, the Java file copy call. And this will work a lot more efficiently than the write to method. But in most cases, they're the same. And if, if the copy isn't available, it will fall back to the, uh, the, the, the slurping and, uh, and, and, and uh, writing end method. Tom. Will it respect the loads? Yeah. No, it's not that smart. I would like to make it that smart. Maybe we should talk about that later. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it's um, it's a reason. Things like this are a reasonably lightweight. I think what he was saying. Uh, oh. were you asking about loads? Yeah. Oh, so I thought I think said loads. I thought no, no, no. I thought this was some like reactive thing. No. Yeah, oh, so, like, yeah, thanks. So will will this work with modes? Yes. So the, this is this is a fallible method. If you imported future, then this would be executed on a different thread. Now, it's probably more relevant with the write to because that is a streaming write, and it does actually say, oh, it doesn't say streaming there. It probably should do. This, this is a streaming write. A key point to be aware of is that although it's executed on a different thread, it's not magically asynchronous. It's still synchronous code. It's just not on the main thread. So you get a future back instantaneously, and at some point that future will be fulfilled when when the synchronous code executes on the other thread. So we can't, we can't magically change how the code runs, but we can, um, we can at least uh, have, it, have it work on a, on, a, on a different thread to get some, um, some asynchronicity. Was there a question there? Yeah, if you wanted to write this to web server and do like an OAuth token or something, how would you go about configuring that? Um, don't know. Um, I haven't got a good answer to that. Well, I'm sure there's something I can do. Oh, uh, as in, as in, if you're, as in, if you're, do you mean? Oh, so if you're, yeah. So you, um, it's a matter of having, having a type class that, uh, that that knows how to write to, for example, whatever kind of resource you want to. So I will show you uh, an example. I've shown you that one, haven't I? That's the uh, that's the stream copy. Are you, Thomas, you're about to tell me that I'm. Yeah, next couple of minutes. Next couple of minutes. Okay, I will I will skip. I've got some stuff on crypto, I'll, I'll skip that. And I'll tell you about this. This is pretty cool. In one line, we can, we can stream straight from our class path. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the hash set class, straight onto S3. So S3, this, this might be similar to your use case, where S3 has some additional connection parameters. You define them in, a, uh, in an implicit. So you have to define your authentication, which is the, the username and, well, effectively username and password. As long as that implicit's available, then it's possible to, to call this. So in one line, we're copying. I don't know why the hell you'd want to do this, copying straight from your class path to S3. But it's a, but it's, it's a demonstration of how, uniform, how uniformly it works and how, how, uh, how consistent it is, I hope. Um, crypto, I will very quickly go over. You can look at these slides. You get two seconds on each one and just pretend you can see what's happening there. Um, it's probably quite, hopefully these, these kind of things are quite intuitive as to what they're doing. You've got a method called decrypt and so on. Um, Key.decrypt. We're using, we're using types extensively. We're using implicits for conf configuration. We've got pluggable, um, pluggable algorithms. Again, it, it's, um, it's not, not, that, uh, not that complicated, not that exciting, really. So XML, on the other hand, is one of the most exciting things on the internet. So I, so I heard in 1995. 
Um, we can... Uh, so I, I, I thought, seeing as I'm plugging in different backends for JSON, what would happen if instead of plugging in a JSON parser, I plugged in uh, an XML parser? And then I just modified the type classes a bit so that it, it, it kind of accessed tag names rather than keys and objects. So I tried all that and made, made, a, few, made a few tweaks and it just didn't work. So I, but it, but it, worked, it worked well enough that I, I, was, I was able to persevere, modify some things, that it, it's now in a state where you can do, you can do most, I'd probably say 75% of the things you can do with Raptor JSON. So Raptor XML is a, it's a very experimental project, but it will hopefully give you the same kind of functionality as I've shown you already. So pattern matching, um, case class extraction, uh, collection extraction, all of these things, but for XML instead of, instead of JSON. So we can do things like this. We can say xml.candidates, zero. Uh, one thing we have to do is have empty parentheses there for, for, for the age, which is a consequence of XML's representation differing slightly from, from JSON. So it's not a perfect match, but we, we, get, we get pretty neat syntax, um, probably better than anything that any of the other uh, XML libraries out there do. We could also do Beeson. I've not, I've not uh, spent time on this yet, but it's a, um, it, it's a possibility. Um, it, it, it's very similar to JSON, obviously, so I, I, at some point I will sit down and spend a couple of days hacking out Rapture Beeson. Last slide. I've tried to combine everything I can from the, from the presentation so far in this, in this one liner, which spreads onto three lines. Uh, who can tell me what this does? By the way, you'll have to guess at what key.encrypt does. Eric? So, so it parses it, then. Yeah. 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 Uh, did everyone hear that? Ho hopefully, if you didn't hear it, it, it's reasonably intuitive. So, I'm quite pleased that in the space of half an hour, we've learned enough Rapture. JSON, Rapture IO, to be able to, to read it, even if not to write it. Um, this, this, is, this is, you would never write this. I, I, don't, I don't know why you'd want to have this as a single line, but it's possible. That's, uh, that's the thing. Uh, that is, I think, the last slide. So thank you for listening. <laughs>